This lecture in four brief parts covers Jewish practices, but before we get to that, let's have a look at three recent Jewish leaders. First, from the Orthodox wing of Judaism, and often this group is referred to as ultra-Orthodox, we have Menachem Mendel Schneerson. He was the seventh and last Rebbe of the Chabad Lubavitch movement, which is a branch of Hasidic Judaism. The name Chabad is an acronym for three Hebrew words that mean wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Here he is giving a public talk in 1987. You can see he's wearing the characteristic outfit that men wear in this group. It's all black with a black hat. As with other Hasidic groups, initially this was just a requirement to dress modestly, without being flashy, without spending a lot of money on oneself. Over time, it became sort of a required uniform to mark you as a member of that group. As a Rebbe, he was believed to be an inspired person who had special experience of God. They're a bit unclear about quite what his status is. Some of them clearly believe that he was the Messiah. Some believe that he died but will return as Messiah. Others believe that he's just gone into hiding. Some believe that he has supernatural powers. Few of them would outright deny that he's the Messiah. The Chabad Lubavitch movement is very concerned to call Jews back to their true identity as the special people of God. In his public teachings, he has said, quote, a Jew is essentially connected with God himself, end quote. And he actually says that the, the entire Torah is taught to all Jews by an angel while they're still in the womb. They're trying to draw in, then, all the secular Jews and the semi-observant Jews to bring them back to their true self, to what they supposedly already have been taught. This group has long been controversial within Judaism. Most Jews, of course, reject the idea that Schneerson is or was the Messiah, nor do they agree with the sort of intense loyalty and devotion that was directed at him during his lifetime. The second leader is Rabbi Jacques Kukirkorn. I'm not sure about the pronunciation of that last name. He's a reform rabbi, and you can find interviews with him on his website and on YouTube. He was born in Brazil. He was a descendant of Hasidic Polish rabbis who emigrated to Brazil in 1929. And as he's explained in public interviews, he has a very typically reform understanding of Judaism. He would say even Orthodox Judaism changes over time. He says even the mainstream of the tradition has never been monolithic. He understands divine revelation to include things like science. He's compared Einstein to Moses. He has the typical reform emphasis on ethics as being the heart of the tradition. And he places a high value on individual autonomy. Autonomy is control over how your life goes. He takes a view that you should adopt whatever religious practices you feel bring you closer to God. Thus, seemingly, he would have no problem with most of the traditions observed by the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox Jews. But he also probably wouldn't have any big objection to Jews who don't eat kosher and who don't keep the holidays in the traditional way and who sort of pick and choose between different parts of the law and decide how they want to keep it. This is a very modern outlook. We place a lot of value on individual choice now. A lot of conservative and orthodox Jews would say that this isn't really Judaism, that these laws really were God-given, and so we can't just choose which ones we'll observe and which ones we'll not observe. In the middle, then, is a very famous person, Rabbi Harold Kushner, born in 1935. He's a conservative rabbi, many would say in the progressive wing of conservative Judaism. He's well known as the author of about a dozen books, including a very famous book called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. This book was written following the death of his son Aaron, who had a premature aging disease. The book deals with questions about human suffering, God, omnipotence, and theodicy. And his basic point is that he denies that God is omnipotent, that God is all-powerful. Instead, God can only sympathize with our suffering. Needless to say, an interesting and a controversial book. More conservative Jews would want to uphold that God is omnipotent. Rabbi Kushner has said that it is, quote, participation in the community that defines us as Jews. The creeds and rituals are secondary, end quote. He says, quote, in Judaism, holiness is found in joining with other people, end quote. And he portrays Jewish commitment as a ladder of observance, where you can be towards the bottom of the ladder or towards the top. 
and he urges less observant or non-observant Jews to slowly become more observant. The more observant you can be, the better. If you're off the ladder, you should try to get onto the first rung. If you're on the first rung of the ladder, you should try to get onto the second rung, and so on. But why should you be observant? Rabbi Kushner has addressed in his writings what the value of observance is, that is, what the value is of keeping Torah, keeping the law. He says that it helps you to do good and to be good. He says that it'll save your life from being wasted. He says it enhances your humanity and that it makes ordinary things holy. The word holy means set apart, as in held aside from the common for some special purpose. The more observant you are as a Jew, the more of your life it governs. Governs how you deal with your family members, how you eat, how you dress. It makes you do all those things differently from other people and imbues them with a sort of value. Rabbi Kushner has also said, quote, The ultimate goal is to transform the world into the kind of world God had in mind when he created it, end quote. He also comments on eating kosher. To eat only kosher food is to eat only the food that is allowed in the Law of Moses in the Jewish Bible. And the following things are forbidden. Insects, sea creatures without scales and fins. That would exclude then things like octopus, shellfish, shrimp, also, no turtles, frogs, horse, pork, oh, that's a hard one, that includes bacon, blood, or wild birds. These are foods which the law declares unclean. If you eat them, it would make you ritually unclean, and you would need to go through a purification process. So fully traditional, fully observant Jews do not eat these things. Even for eating things like beef and chicken, there are strict rules about how they can be killed and processed. And so Jews need to have those products be certified as kosher in their procedures. That's why, for instance, if you look at a package of hot dogs on some brands, you'll see that it has a mark that certain group of rabbis has certified that as kosher in the way it's processed. If you're Jewish and you're going to strictly abide by kosher rules, you cannot eat in a lot of restaurants there are a lot of things commonly in grocery stores that you can't buy. And it's even problematic to be invited over to the house of a non-Jew to eat because they're not going to have observed these rules. Now, why would God make rules like this? Rabbi Kushner has said, quote, there's nothing intrinsically wicked about eating pork or lobster, end quote. A lot of people have speculated that these things could have been forbidden for health reasons, that at least in the ancient world it was dangerous or unhealthy to eat these things. Others have speculated there could be ecological reasons that somehow eating these things could be bad for the environment, whereas cows and chicken are okay for the environment. Kushner doesn't have a part of these speculations. He just says that these give a kind of meaning to the everyday activity of preparing and eating and serving food. Finally, one kosher rule that you might want to know about is that they use separate dishes for meat and dairy. They'll eat meat and dairy but they don't eat them at the same time. They don't mix them together in any of their recipes. So if you're trying to feed a hamburger to your Jewish friend, don't give them a cheeseburger. Don't give them a bacon cheeseburger, for God's sake. And if you visit an Orthodox house and notice that there are separate sets of dishes and utensils, well, this is why. In our next segment, circumcision, Sabbath-keeping, and other Jewish practices. <laughs> 